Hello and welcome. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS. And it is a great honor to chair the proceedings today for the annual Meiji Jingu Autumn Lecture. Moto wa minna onaji nezashi no hitogusa mo kotoba no hana ya chiji ni sakuram. In the beginning, people, like all of our plants, sprang from one root, followed by flowers of language blooming forth by the thousands. This poem by Empress Shoken, written in 1882, on the topic of universal brotherhood is an excellent introduction to tonight's topic. As we stand on the eve of an escalating war in the Middle East, the question of humanitarianism looms larger than ever before. What point is there to the discourse of human rights if they remain just an abstract concept? Is the idea of universal brotherhood so strongly gendered just another Western invention forcibly impressed onto the rest of the world as morally superior. What you are about to hear in many ways speaks to the roots of humanitarianism, not as a Western import to Japan, but as an extension of the way of the human, Jindo, an indigenous Japanese concept. The translation of the poem with which I began has been undertaken by Harold Wright and is part of this magnificent collection of poems by Empress Shoken issued by the Meiji Jingu this year to mark the 110th anniversary of her passing. As always, we would like to acknowledge the Meiji Jingu Intercultural Research Institute for their generous support. I'm particularly honored to welcome back to SOAS the director of the Meiji Jingu Intercultural Research Institute Mr. Masahiro Sato, who came all the way from Tokyo to attend today's lecture. With him is, like last year, Mr. Kaito Nakajima. The annual lecture is always a wonderful occasion to thank the Institute, which not only supports this lecture, but also an annual scholarship program for two SOAS doctoral students studying any aspect of Japan and an annual research grant for the academic members of the Japan Research Center. We are entering the 17th year of support, which means that 34 students have benefited from the Meiji Jingu studentship. Can we have, please, a round of applause? Thank you. It is my great pleasure, finally, to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Michiko Suzuki is a well-known entity here at SOAS. She has both done an MA in Japanese studies with us in 2007, and in 2014 added an MA in historical research methods. In between, she has worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross Japan delegation in Tokyo before returning to SOAS to do her PhD on the history of the Japanese Red Cross movement. She was also, in fact, a recipient of the Meiji Jingu Japanese Studies Research Scholarship in the first year of her PhD back in 2014-2015. She is currently a research scholar in the history of modern and contemporary Japan at the University of Tokyo and has widely published on the history of disaster and relief efforts. Most recently, she has turned her research into a book that just came out with Columbia University Press. The title is, as you can see here, Humanitarian Internationalism Under Empire, The Global Evolution of the Japanese Red Cross Movement, 1877 to 1945. Now, Columbia University Press has kindly provided a stall outside in the cloisters in the Paul Webley wing, where you can have a look at the book and also purchase it at a 20% discount. 
We will follow a traditional academic format with the lecture first and then ample opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh, listeners online, welcome. You can start to feed especially burning questions into the Q&A functions as the talk goes on. For those in the room, please keep stumm until the end where you will have ample chance to ask questions. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michiko Suzuki for this year's Meiji Jingle Autumn Lecture. So thank you for a lovely introduction, um, Fabio. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as a former student at SOAS University of London, it is my great honor to be invited to the SOAS Meiji Jingle Autumn Lecture. I would like to express my gratitude to the Japan Research Center and Meiji Jingu. It was coincident that I was granted a Meiji Jingu uh, Studies Research Scholarship at the 100 year anniversary of the Empress Shoken Fund. And I published my book at the 110 year anniversary of the Empress Shoken Fund this year. Let me tell you a bit more among other connections, Empress Shokin's anniversary and my birthday fall on the same date. <laughs> During my studies at SOAS, I received invaluable financial assistance in scholarship from the Nippon Foundation, the Great Britain Sasagao Foundation, and the Japan Foundation Endowment Committee, among others. I would have never completed my research without their generous financial support. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude for all this support. My student life at SOAS was one of the greatest moments of my life. I met so many interesting people. They stimulated my future career path and I had many precious experiences. I went to Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, I travelled to the Cotswolds and had drinks at Covent Garden with my friends until midnight. I also visited the kindergarten and the primary school in northern London that I attended for three years as a child and met up with many old friends. My life at SOAS was such a wonderful moment to prepare for throwing myself into a really hard professional life. I also like to express my gratitude to Professor Gigi, the chair of the Japan Research Center, who organized this event, and most of all to Professor Stephen Dodd and Dr. Christopher Gartais, who were mentors in writing my MA dissertation and PhD thesis. Finally, I want to express from the bottom of my heart my gratitude to Professor Emeritus Stephen Vlasters, University of Iowa, who for the past four years has mentored the completion of my book. Um, let's move on to my talk this evening. Uh, this lecture is extracted from my book, uh, from my book, Humanitarian Internationalism Under Empire, the Global Evolution of the Japanese Red Cross Movement from 1877 to 1945, which has just released by Columbia, Columbia University Press this summer. Um, it is, uh, it is the first research monograph in English on the history of the Japanese Red Cross Movement grounded in multi-archival Japanese and English language primary and secondary sources, thus contributing a growing body of scholarship on humanitarian ideologies and organizations that developed outside the West in the formative period up to the Second World War. These are major archives which I used. The evidence that form, uh, forms the basis of the book's revisionist narratives has been culled from multiple national, local, and personal archives in Japan, Switzerland, the US, the UK, China, Korea, and Brazil over a period of 20 years. 
My monograph recovers the history of the Japanese Red Cross Society, JRSS, and with it, the indigenous humanitarian movement in modern Japan from a reductionist historiography in both Japanese and English language historiography that misrepresent the JRSS as a top-down organization, wholly subordinate to the government and the imperial family, and derivative of Western values and institutional models. It relocates the JRSS within the transnational discourse of peacetime and wartime international humanitarianism to which the JRSS contributed as much as it borrowed. In chapter one, I explored the grassroots movement of Japanese humanitarianism, Jindo, literally meaning the way of humanity in Japanese, and Japan's rule in the foundation of the League of Red Cross Societies in 1919. One of my important findings is that the JRSS was a pioneer in Red Cross natural disaster relief operations. I will talk about chapter two tonight. In chapter three, I explored JRC's activities in colonial territories such as Korea and Manchuria. And in chapter four, I highlighted the JRC's overseas branch societies in conjunction with Japanese immigration to Hawaii and Brazil. In chapter five, I explored wartime JRC's relief operations, focusing on allied and Japanese POWs and civilian internees using previously unsighted JRC's primary, primary documents. In chapter six, I discussed humanitarian professionalism demonstrated in emergency relief activities in the aftermath of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombings with a focus on JRC's nurses. In the conclusion, I linked the Japanese modern notion of humanitarianism to Japan's philosophical tradition by quoting Kamono Chome's Hojoki. Kamono Chome was a 12th century author, poet, and essayist who responded to contemporary crises by bearing witness to human misery and came to terms with the eschatological world of human existence through the mediation mediation of the Buddhist concept of impermanence, Mujo. The book develops uh, five research findings, the melding of Western and Japanese humanitarian traditions and organizational forms, the strong grassroots vector in the JRCS, the steady growth to become world largest international organization by the First World War, the society's pioneering role in Red Cross disaster relief and inclusion of non-Western national societies in the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, advocacy of comprehensive legal protections of civilians in wartime at the 1934 Tokyo International Red Cross Conference, and the evolution of the JRCS from a national into a transnational organization with scores of branch societies both in Japan's overseas empire and in Asia Pacific and North and South America. The findings deconstruct the binary that still prevails in Western historiography between the development of modern secular humanitarianism in the West and in the rest of the world. In addition, the book provides a fresh vantage point to address large historical questions relating to Japanese modernization and internationalism before the Second World War. Let me briefly introduce the history of the JRSS before I move on to the narrative of 15th International Conference of the Red Cross in Tokyo. The JRCS was founded in 1877. The early date of the founding of the JRCS and the rapid development of the society challenges the dominant Western-centric narrative of the modern humanitarianism as an exclusively Western origin and Christian-based charity movement. 
From the beginning, native Japanese traditions of humanitarianism expressed in the Japanese notion of jindo, whose literal meaning is the way of humanity, infused the ethos of the JRCS. At the national level, the JRCS enjoy the patronage of the imperial family, but organizationally it developed into a strong grassroots movement that expanded its activities beyond medical aid to combatants in international conflicts. The rapid growth of the JRCS was made possible by the involvement of thousands of ordinary people in humanitarian activities in the form of self-reliant efforts to survive social uncertainties such as poverty, natural disasters, epidemic diseases and civil wars following the Meiji Restoration. By responding to local humanitarian crisis, as well as assisting the nation in Japan's foreign wars, the JRCS tapped into ordinary Japanese people's communitarianism and patriotism, and the society experienced a dramatic increase in membership to more than 2 million members in 1920. In 1945, the JRSS had more than 15 million members, including colonial subjects, which was far and away the highest amongst the National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies worldwide. From its earliest days, the JRCS promoted natural disaster and peacetime relief activities both within Japan and on the global stage, including the foundation of the League of Red Cross Societies of 1919, currently the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC. The wartime relief activities of the JRCS also served as a model for a number of the amendments of the Geneva Conventions. The image on the right shows a cover of the JRCS monthly magazine published in 1934, symbolizing the Red Cross's goal to elevate. Well, what happened? Okay. Elevate um, pain and suffering around the world. In this year, the JR says, is that, okay. oh, I tried to change. Yeah, sorry. Um, hosts, uh, in this year, the JRSS hosts the 15th International Conference of the Red Cross in Tokyo. The society faced the dual challenges of maintaining its humanitarian mandates in the fraught context of the Japan's army, Japanese army's expanding military operations in China, the government's withdrawal from the League of Nations, the increasingly authoritarian domestic political context, and the international context of the diminishing commitment of the great powers to the very principles of world peace and international law. The conference concluded with delegates uh, anonymously adopting the Tokyo Declaration, which called for the protection of civilians during armed conflicts. The Tokyo Declaration was not endorsed by any of the great powers and not adopted by the ICRC in Switzerland before the eruption of the Pacific War, but principles enunciated in the 1934 Tokyo Declaration became the foundation of a forced Geneva Convention's provisions on the protections of civilian persons in time of war of 1949. This map shows the overseas locations of major JRCS departments and chapters before the Second World War. Beginning in the 1890s and continuing into the Second World War, the JRCS expanded overseas operations in tandem with Japanese imperialism and the worldwide Japanese diaspora. Beginning in 1894, the JRCS opened chapters and branches in new imperial territories, including Korea, Taiwan, and Karafto, and established overseas committee departments, some of which were temporary, while others lasted into the Second World War in Vladivostok, Chinese Treaty Ports, Hawaii, and the Philippines. 
By the start of the Second World War, the JRSS also opened, had also opened overseas a department in North and South American cities that hosted the large concentrations of Japanese nationals. During the Pacific War, the JRSS sent aid parcel to Japanese civilian internees in the US, the UK, and Oceania, and operated exchange repatriation operations with allied nations in Lorenzo Marquez, currently Mozambique's capital, Maputo, Goa, and Vladivostok. The top photo on the left shows the opening of the JRSS assembly convened at the JRCS Korean headquarters located in Seoul. They discussed a number of issues related to the humanitarian crisis in East Asia. For example, the JRCS Korean headquarters hospital developed Korean professional nursing training. One of the most notable initiatives of the JRCS colonial branches was the provision of medical treatment and material aid to Koreans residing in the greater Tokyo area injured or left destitute by the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake and the ensuring massacre of resident Koreans by Korean JRCS Korean headquarters. The photo, uh, photo at the bottom shows the central hospital of the Manchukuo Red Cross Society. In addition to supporting military operations, JRC's colonial branches played a significant role for wartime relief activities and sanitation control in Asia. This pie chart shows the distribution of JRC's membership within the Japanese empire as of 1945. As you see, one third of the entire membership consisted of the JRC's in Korea. Both the JRC's Korea and Manchuria were multinational and multi-ethnic organizations. Let's move on to the main topic of this lecture. This is an official photograph of delegates to the 1934 Tokyo International Red Cross Conference, the largest and most ge geographically diverse international Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference of the interwar period, which was the first to convene in Asia. It invited guests from all five continents, representing both nation states and colonial positions in the Middle East, Asia, Africa and North and South America and recently decolonized countries such as Afghanistan, Iran and Cuba, making it the largest international gathering of non-governmental civil organi society organizations prior to the Second World War. A total of 119 officials of the Red Cross and Red Crescent societies in Europe, North and South America, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Oceania attended, in addition to representatives of major international organizations such as the League of Nations and the Boy Scouts. The total number of participants were 319. From this part, uh, this lecture explores the JRC's humanitarian diplomacy during the conference under the leadership of JRC's president, Tokugawa Iesato, the 16th head of the Tokugawa family. In the process, the JRC successfully coordinated its activities with numerous rational Red Cross societies, including societies of nations at odds with Japan's foreign policy, notably such as the Red Cross Society of China and the American Red Cross ARC. Born into the Tyas branch of the Tokugawa clan in 1863, Yesato witnessed the end of the shogunate and the swift disappearance of feudal society. Educated in England, where he graduated from Eton College, Yesato avoided partisan politics. Content to project the public image of a noble gentleman and aristocrat from old times, he was at ace among world leaders and circulated seamlessly in high political circles in Japan. He performed to wield influence behind the scenes. A prominent philosophist, 
Yesato serves as the chair of a range of social welfare organizations and engaged in education and cultural activities. When the Great Kanto earthquake of 1923 struck Tokyo and Yokohama, killing more than 100,000 people, Iesato led a successful fundraising campaign in Japan and rallied support from the International Red Cross community. At the 1930 Brussels International Red Cross Conference, Iesato, as the president of the JRCS, appealed to delegates to select Tokyo to host the 1934 conference by presenting Tokyo's rapid recovery as an inspiring example of what international humanitarian cooperation can accomplish. He said, at the time of the great earthquake of 1923, which laid waste the cities of Tokyo and Yokohama, you helped us in various ways promptly and substantially. We therefore most earnestly desire the next World Conference be held in Tokyo so that we may show you these cities that have been so miraculously reconstructed. Tokugawa Yesato's career as a non-partisan um, political figure, deep involvement in social welfare and diplomatic experience made him the ideal leader of the JRCS during the turbulent decade of the 1930s. And his aloofness from partisan politics made him a good fit with the Red Cross commitment to political neutrality. Furthermore, his great popularity Mm. amongst ordinary Japanese people as shogun sama and his strong traditional network with local authorities and former daimyo families throughout Japan helped to make JRC's local chapters the driving force in the development of Japan's nationwide humanitarian movement. To raise the visibility of the 1934 conference, Yesato embarked on an eight month tour of foreign capitals from August 1933 to April 1934. His mission received extensive favorable press coverage both in the US and the UK. For example, on 6 March in New Orleans, the headline of the Times Picayune read Prince Tokugawa voices earnest desire of Japan for peace with America, and a pulled quote in the article stated, Japanese statement brings message of amity. In Honolulu, the Gigi Press headline proclaimed, Japan-US relationship is strong. British newspapers introduced Iesato as the king's visitor, and Morning Post ran the headline, Britain and Japan brothers. In the UK, Yesato delivered a speech at the Japan Society in London in which he expressed his sincere affection towards the UK. Whenever I come to England, I'm reminded of my first visit. It was very back in, way back in as 1877, when I was 15 years of age and I stayed here for about five years as a student. During my stay, a great honour was conferred upon me when I was presented to Her Majesty Queen Victoria. In response to Iesat's speech, John Asbrook Simon, first Viscount Simon, British Foreign Secretary, emphasised the long-term friendship between the Tokugawa Japan and Great Britain, referring to the first Englishman, William Adams, who served as an advisor to Tokugawa Ieyasu. In the US, he visited the American Red Cross. In a conversation with ARC chairman, John Barton Payne, Yesato emphasized Payne his great personal interest in promoting world peace, which he claimed has been the tradition of my family during the three centuries it held the position as shoguns. He reminded Payne that his ancestor, Tokugawa Yesada authorized the signing of the 1854 Treaty of Peace and Amity, Japan's first international treaty of the modern area after the arrival of Matthew Perry. While affirming maintenance of friendly relationship with Germany and Italy, Yesato wrote the, that 
if the three nations, Japan, the UK and the US, build up a close relationship, not only Asia, but the world will maintain its peace. The Tokyo Conference was the first International Red Cross Conference to adopt English as an official language alongside French in a challenge to the French-speaking Switzerland-based ICRC movement. Although initially uh, fiercely opposed, the Geneva leadership eventually agree agreed. Using English as a lingua franca makes the conference more independent from the Switzerland-based -based ICRC. It is also possible that promoting English to official language status was a welcoming gesture to Anglo-American nations at a time to ameliorate imperial tension in Asia Pacific. The Red, the Red Cross issued taking political positions in accordance with uh, a vote uh, stance of complete neutrality. This does not mean, however, that the JRC's planning for the conference did not involve diplomatic balancing acts. A case in point was Manchukuo, because the international committee refused to recognize Manchukuo as an independent nation state, whether or not to invite delegations from the Manchukuo government tested the JRC's political autonomy. Ultimately, we can infer that the JRCS did not an issue an invitation to the Manchukuo government. The JRCS attempted to steer a middle course on the delicate issue of representation of colonial colonized peoples, sending invitation to the Iraqi Red Crescent Society, the Haiti Red Cross Society, and the Nicaraguan Red Cross, which had not been admitted to be official international Red Cross and Red Crescent members by the ICRC at that time. The Red Crescent Society of Iraq, a British a protectorate, initially declines the invitation to attend. Undeterred by the initial rejection, the JRCS persisted and in the end, the executive committee of the Red Crescent Alliance attended, in addition to the Turkish Red Crescent Society and the Red Lion and Sun Society of Helger, currently the Iranian Red Crescent Society. One difficult issue was who was, uh, was, who was to represent British India, the JRCS invited the Indian Red Cross Society, which was founded as an independent national society, where upon British ambassador Sir Robert Clive informed the JRCS that he would be attending, representing both Great Britain and on behalf of the government of India. This prompted the JRCS to consult with both the British government and the Indian Red Cross Society. It was a delicate balancing act. In the end, the Indian Red Cross Society sent a delegation and during the conference, the JRCS distributed reports from the Indian Red Cross Society to conference delegates, a matter of protocol that implied official recognition. At the same time, the JRCS made special provision for observer status of the British Raj. The American Red Cross Philippines chapter, whose delegation included Americans and Filipinos, received special recognition during the conference by being seated with the representatives of the world powers. In perhaps the most uh, dramatic uh, demonstration of the JRCS commitment to international inclusiveness, the JRCS sponsors the Union of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies of the USSR, Soviet Red Cross and Red Crescent, to be a member of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, even though the United States refused to, uh, dem uh, diplomatic uh, uh, representations of the USSR until 1933. The League of Red Cross Societies accepted Soviet membership by anonymous consent just before the conference in early October 1934, which was wide, widely publicized in the Japanese press. Both the JRCS leaders and membership motivated by, uh, both by patriotism and a commitment to 
relieving human suffering and advancing the well-being of common people worldwide. I term this humanitarian patriotism. For instance, Inoue Enji, a leading JSS official with extensive international experience argued in an essay published in the JRC's monthly magazine that the global mandate of the Red Cross had expanded beyond its original mission of impartial medical aid in wartime to include the advancement of public welfare worldwide by providing humanitarian aid that individual states could not accomplish on their own. The 1932 Shanghai incident put unprecedented pressure on the JRSS, not only because of the intensity of the battle, but also because the Imperial Japanese Army violated the Geneva Conventions in using illegal weapons and causing the death of aid workers of the Red Cross Society of China, RCSC. These incidents shocked the JRCS as well as the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. The JRCS and the Red Cross Society of China, uh, RCSC, communicated during the battle. To document their allegations, the RCSC attached a number of photos, including this photo of a RCSC officer killed during the battle. The JSS sent copies of RCSC reports in confidential communique to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and ministers of the Imperial Army and Navy, urging to decrease illegal military operations. This warning by the JSS to the Japanese military has remained, uh, remained confidential to this day. In doing so, the JRCS hoped to gain RCSC participation in the Tokyo conference and also to retain credibility in the eyes of the ICRC and the American Red Cross. The uncertainty of the political situation in the aftermath of the Shanghai incident prompted the JRCS to carry out a wide range of confidential investigations. For example, in a report it shared with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the JRCS analyzed developments in the anti-Japanese boycott movement and the Japanese association in China in order to anticipate the potential political impact of its activities on the conference. At the same time, the JRCS made a special effort to secure the participation of the Red Cross Society of China the invitation sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China in Nanjing read, Japan welcomes you. These efforts before fru uh, bore fruit on 14 uh, July 1934, when a Director General of the Red Cross so Society of China replied to the invitation stating, I beg to say that it is a great honor coupled with the highest pleasure to be able to participate in the coming conference and I'm looking forward with great expectation to have honor to meet you all. In the end, Man Tianze, an official of the Republic of China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, attended as the representative of the Red Cross Society of China. The JSS was an early and enthusiastic sponsor of the Junior Red Cross movement. In an essay published in 1925, Inoue Enji, the Director General of the Japanese JRCS Investigation Department, explained that the three missions of the Junior Red Cross were the worldwide promotion of children's health, intellectual advancement, and citizenship. He extolled the Junior Red Cross as the core of the World Peace Project. The Tokyo 15th International Conference of the Red Cross was the first international conference where children played a prominent role. During the conference, 5,068 uh, 5, children belonging to the Japanese Junior Red Cross participated in the Congress and assisted operations and logistics. They welcomed participants, delivered speeches, and accomplished guests to cele uh, ceremonies and social events. 
The left uh, panel shows a leaflet promoting the International Pen Pal Project was distributed to delegations during the conference. Through person-to-person -person communication, children hold the key to world peace, illustrating the JRSS understood that. The JRSS was a leading promoter of the Junior Red Cross worldwide, and it featured prominently in events during the Tokyo conference. The JRSS Junior Red Cross had enrolled 2,365,710 members by August 1934, second only to the United States. In showcasing Japan's modernity, the JRSS pulled out all the stops and spared no expense in organized exhibitions and excursions that highlighted Japan's social and economic development, including nursing education and modern industry, while also introducing Japanese culture, natural features, and history. For example, delegates' wives visited JRSS hospitals a spining mill factory, women's prisons, and Tokyo Women's Medical Professional School, which graduated a number of female doctors. The JRSS arranged excursion to famous tourist sites in Kamakura, Nikko, Hakone, Kyoto, Osaka, Nara, Hiroshima, Kumamoto, and even Seoul and Chonchon in its overseas empires. The JRSS also organized cultural activities and receptions to introduce delegates to the traditional arts of kabuki, no, and gagaku. Iesato held a banquet at the Tokyo Kaikan, and Prime Minister Okada Keisuke hosted a dinner party at his official residence. The mayor of Tokyo also hosted a dinner party to thank participants for their support during the counter great earthquake of 1923. A total of more than 500 guests attended. Delegates and wives visited the great Kanto earthquake memorial nearby Sumida River and paid homage to earthquake victims at the Meiji Shrine and the Yasukuni Shrine. The Iwasaki and Mitsui families hosted garden parties with demonstrations of traditional Japanese arts of calligraphy, ink brush painting, and flower arrangement. Delegates also visited the Japan Visual Arts Academy to see Japanese traditional paintings. Princess Kai, in honorary chair of the Volunteer Nurse Women's Association, hosted a tea party to impress on delegates advances in Japanese nursing. There was no end to the whining and dining of delegates. In the context of the recent rise to power of the Nazi party in Germany, a classical music concert celebrating the 70th birthday of the renowned German composer, Richard Strauss, took on special significance. Sir Klaus Pringsheim from the Tokyo Academy of Music, currently the Tokyo University of Art, conducted the orchestra at the Hibia Public Hall. Pringsheims was a German Jewish composer and conductor who had studied composition under Gustav Mahler. The fact that one year earlier in 1933, the German government had adopted sweeping laws denying employment of non-Aryans in public life, including the performing arts made JRSS staging of Pringsheim's concert an implicit criticism of Nazism. Yet, it must have been a bittersweet moment for Strauss, who was criticized at the time, and after for accepting the prestigious appointment as a director of the uh, Bayreuth Festival after Alto Toscanini had resigned the directorship in protest Nazi racist policies. Perhaps the most significant achievement of the 15th International Conference of the Red Cross was the anonymous adoption of the Tokyo Declaration, which included conventions on the protection of enemy civilians. The Tokyo Declaration consisted of 48 resolutions and some resolutions contained of a number of articles. 
The official name of Resolution 39, which in Western language legal discourse known as the Tokyo Draft, is the Draft International Convention on the Condition and Protection of Civilians of Enemy Nationality who are on territory belonging to, to or occupied by a belligerent. Resolutions were drafted by the JRSS and the American Red Cross with contributions from the League of Red Cross Societies and ICRC Executive Committee and more than 10 National Red Cross chapters and represented a new direction for the Red Cross in the formation of human dignity and advancement of health and well-being. The great advancement of the Tokyo Declaration was to make enemy civilians beneficiaries of humanitarian international law in wartime in Resolution 39. As history would tragically show, the declaration anticipated, anticipated critical humanitarian crisis during the Second World War. In the European Holocaust, Germany exterminated millions of Jews and other undesirable in gas chambers and forced labor camps. Both the Axis and Allied powers indiscriminately bombed civilians with Allied fire bombing assault in German, Germany and Japan responsible for the greatest number of the victims who in the bombing of German cities included war refugees. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombings not only immediately killed several hundred thousand civilians, the bombs unleashed radiation poisoning that would continue to annihilate human, animal and plant life long after, enacting another Holocaust. Today, uh, Russian missiles have killed many Ukraine civilians and Islam's massive bombing of Gaza has resulted in tens of thousands of civilian deaths. However, before the Tokyo conference convened, the major European powers signaled their rejection of the substance of Resolution 39 of the Tokyo Declaration. For example, the UK representative objected the drafts were insufficient, while the French government responded with a firm and definite refusal. In fact, none of the governments of the great powers were willing to accept comprehensive protections of enemy civilians. As a result, the Convention on the Protections of Enemy Civilians in Wartime was not added to the Geneva Conventions before the outbreak of the Second World War. Although not ratified before the war, the Tokyo Declaration laid the foundation of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Conventions provisions on the protections of civilian persons in time of war. The 15th International Conference in Tokyo illustrated the challenges facing the JRSS at a time of growing international tensions and the delicate balancing out of humanitarian diplomacy that was required. Whereas the JRSS, the Japanese government, the ICRC, and the world powers were reluctant to support the Tokyo Conference, the JRSS led the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement as a mediator with skill and tact. It made a serious effort to address the Red Cross Society of China's allegations of Japanese violations of the rules of war and closely cooperated with the American Red Cross. In later years, Max Huber, the president of the ICRC, lauded the proceedings of the Tokyo Conference as outstandingly successful. An ICRC memoranda predicted that the Tokyo Conference would expand by every means possible effort to prevent war and encourage better understanding among nations. Yesato later said to the JRC's officials, Externally, we were facing unprecedented global crisis. Internally, we did not have any parallel experiences to resolve our critical situation regarding Japan. As host of the international conference, our strenuous efforts were not feeble at all. We should be proud of ourselves. 
Iesato passed away at the age of 76 in 1940 before the attack on Pearl Harbor, a death likely precipitate, uh, per, per, precipitated by overwork and stress. In recognition of his exceptional contribution to humanitarian causes at home and abroad, Iesato was awarded the Grand Cordon of the Supreme Order of the Chrysanthemum shortly after his death. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for a very timely and also, well, if you think about it, quite disturbing presentation, for we are in a very similar situation where the Western nations sort of say, well, you know, we've done everything that we can, really. Uh, it's very interesting. As a Swiss national, I was born in Switzerland, where, of course, the Red Cross is sort of part of the national identity, national ideology. And this idea that, yes, the Geneva Convention really is the most crucial, you know, uh, point in the history of the Red Cross. It's very interesting to see how you wonderfully sort of decenter this idea and argue that actually uh, it was anticipated very much or mm -hmm. pre-formulated even um, by the Tokyo um, Declaration. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, as there's so many questions that, that come to mind, but the, one thing that really struck me was that here you have an NGO, a non-governmental organization, that is in many aspects government-like, hmm. that has sort of almost its own for, foreign uh, diplomacy, like a kind of soft diplomacy. The, it has outreach, it has a particular political structure, hmm. it has sort of a, a grassroots basis that it can mobilize. What was the Japanese government's reaction to that? Did, didn't they feel also that, you know, there's an interesting tension uh, uh, between the grassroots movements. Yes. Um, for example, uh, it's like a Red Cross was acted like the safe net. And if you see the aftermath of the tsunami and earthquake, Japanese government could do nothing because it's just once at the same time, once at one moment, many uh, tens of thousands of people became you know, the victims of natural disaster. So the Japanese government was very happy to have a Red Cross who, uh, you know, the um, uh, operates the national disaster relief, which the government could not accomplish at all. The same things happened in during the Spanish flu because the epidemic was expanded and rapidly, so the government couldn't do nothing. So the Red Cross just and um, treated the victims um, promptly and uh, according, according to the local needs. I don't think there is any um, tensions between government right. and the GRCs in this case of the natural disaster reliefs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, I'll open up to the floor. Any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, if I may. Um, I'm curious, Michiko, were you able to establish any um, connections in the language of the 1934 Declaration and any post-war protection language for civilians in either the Declaration of Human Rights or maybe amendments to the Geneva Convention. Does any of the language from the 1934 statement show up in the post-war declaration? Yes, it was added to the um, fourth Geneva Convention in 1949. Uh, I mean... Uh, I haven't checked it very precisely, but anyway, and the ideal of the Tokyo Declaration became the foundation of the Geneva Convention. And after the war, uh, everybody just agreed with the Tokyo Declaration because the war ended. So all the governments accepted the Tokyo Declaration to other Geneva Convention. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Before the presentation, but I'm just simple question or much more basic question. And mm -hmm. you're saying that there's so many uh, members in uh, Japanese Red Cross and mm -hmm. before the World War II, mm -hmm. but how? I mean, how the Japanese Red Cross and um, getting uh, such a high name, a uh, huge member of the um the Japanese from the Japanese society because you know right now compared to the situation in Japan right now, mm -hmm. I think the civil society is quite has been quite weak 
And I think that it's quite difficult for any kind of NGOs to get a membership right now. Mm. So compared to that period, I think how they could do it, I think that might be a kind of thing for the I mean, civil society in China right now as well. So just yeah. how, okay. how do they acquire the uh, large number of members? Yeah, once the system, the JRCs used the Chonaikai system, which uh, looted in the top of the period, like a Tonari Gumi and you know the cooperative um, groups of the Tokugawa time. So when natural disaster occurred, just people joined these kind of groups, which people called Red Cross, and they naturally grew and cooperated to each other, and it became very huge, huge. And this is also it's not like a charity; it's a kind of a mutual aid, helping each other. People helping each other. You say, for example, in Totori, there's a largest, uh, huge earthquake occurred in late 18th century, uh, 19th century. They joined the Totori. Uh, no, sorry, Shimane. Shimane Red Cross Society. They founded Shimane Red Cross Society by themselves. It was not related to the central movement of the Tokyo JRCS. They, they, each local people founded Red Cross Society in each prefectures. We did not really link to the national movement of the Red Cross. So um, actually the Japanese Red Cross was founded by Sano Tsunetami in Tokyo. But by the 1877, there's already have a civil Red Cross society in uh, through, uh, throughout Japan. So it's a kind of like a mutual aid, helping each other and do paying and also the Red Cross used the Chonaikai system. Thank you. Uh, for the uh, participants online, you can feed your questions into the Q&A uh, screen at the bottom of the screen. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, just. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, in Mr. Tokugawa. I'm wondering if the imperial family were also involved uh, in the pre-war period. Yes. They are great patron. Uh, I mean, the major emperor and Empress Shokan were patronage of the JRCS, and they founded the Empress Shokan Fund. It is still a lot, the biggest fund in, in the international Red Cross community even today. And also, um, Prince uh, Hirohito uh, also had a fundraising campaign during the 1923 earthquake. And it's quite successful to got a lot of donations. So, but uh, actually, in order to get rid of the image of the Red Cross as a Christian organization, the Red Cross used the Imperial Family to, you know, the, remove the, this kind of image. It's, it also incorporates the Japanese traditions. So, if you say, for example, the Empress Komyo in Nara period have like a social welfare activities. So, this kind of tradition also good fit with the Red Cross. So Imperial family are very happy to support this kind of movement as well. But Tokugawa also supported the Red Cross. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, going off the ideas of the Red Cross sort of being this somewhat political organization, the 1934 conference seems to be like an interesting snapshot in terms of the world's Mm. political bodies, right? Especially if we're considering the colonial representation in these spots. And you mentioned uh, the representation of uh, the, the British Raj, and, and you briefly mentioned uh, Manchuria not having that representation. Mm. Um, I'd like, I was wondering, in the, in the conference itself, uh, by the way, I have so many questions and all related to the conference, <laughs> but about it, um, about the, the Korean and the Taiwanese representation or other parts of the Japanese empire mm. oh, and beyond. Um, in the conference, and how did Japan or the JRCS reconcile with um, sort of empowering maybe other imperial colonial uh, Red Cross societies to have a place in the in the conference, and maybe not extending the same sort of uh, representation to their own. Yeah, it was a very difficult, delicate and balancing act of the JRCS. Of course, there are a lot of um, success and failure as well, but um, they they act as a bit mostly like a behind the scenes and um, and I mean diplomatic conversations they had. But also, I'd like to mention about more about the JRCS Korea and Manchuria. It was a very um, multinational and 
multiracial organization. Actually, so many Manchurians and Koreans, they joined the Red Cross. And it was very difficult why they joined the Red Cross, but I think that it was perhaps the pragmatic reasons. There's a lot of, I mean, the epidemic disease in Korean Peninsula and all the Northern China, and local people suffering. So that's they, that, that why I think that they joined, just joined the Red Cross. And they didn't care whether it was a Japanese or Manchurian and Koreans, they could just join the humanitarian organization to, um, I mean, improve, improve their conditions in uh, Japanese colonial territories. Oh, thank you. Sorry, um, I just had a question about how the uh, how the Red Cross managed to function uh, within the Japanese colonial territories, at least because I just was reading the title of your book about. Global evolution and the mm -hmm. Red Cross movement there. So, that yeah, I, I know that I, I I think if I'm not mistaken that the Japanese constitution the three walls and kind of the, the emperor and the government the military mm -hmm. separate. You mentioned there was no friction really so much with the no. government side, but I wondered about with the military where certain acts might be taken during the war and then the Red Cross yeah, yeah, would yeah. go in. Is, mm. is there any friction? Yeah. No, military are very happy to have the Japanese Red Cross because the Japanese Red Cross treated wounded and sick uh, uh, during the armed conflict. And also Red Cross uh, acted in the framework of the Geneva Conventions. So the Japanese uh, Japanese government also ratified the Geneva Conventions. At that time, they only had the two Geneva Conventions. So the JRC followed the second and uh, Geneva Conventions and treated the Japanese wounded soldiers on the battlefield. So they use a lot about the Red Cross. So it's all legally uh, active, legal activities uh, in accordance with the Gen second Geneva Conventions. So it's, it's no conflicts. But actually the Tokyo conference was uh, have attentions. The Japanese government did not want this kind of conference hugely. So there's a lot of discussion between Minister of Foreign Affairs and the officials of the JRSS. And the Japanese government did not fund it the conference. Only military, a ministry of Navy and Army funded this conference because they wanted to use the Red Cross for the treatment of the wounded and sick during the battle. That's, that's not really what we talked about. Mm -hmm. It's really after the mm -hmm. learn about the battle. Popular media was actually a dark That was the Japanese uh, independent organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, I think you said that at the time the Japanese Red Cross was the large, had the most members in the world. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the catalyst for the explosion in membership? Was it the Great Kanto earthquake or perhaps the popularity of Tokugawa, who was still? Yes, I think the popularity of Tokugawa was one reason, one factor, because he had a huge network with former daimyos throughout Japan. He has great networks. So it was only one reason. But also the earthquakes and tsunami has another factor because they needed this kind of aid. So people just joined this organization, donating and sending materials. So say, for example, after the Tokyo uh, Great Tokyo earthquake, uh, Great Kanto earthquake, the membership increasing dramatically. Mm. Yes, second question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. I'm asking because uh, we've had this conversation before. And um, so we all, we, all, we all understand that total mobilization after 1940 mm -hmm. changes everything. No, so it changes everything. Let's not worry about that right now. And, and then we, we, we know that around 1937, it all starts to go down. So let's not worry about that. But until about 1937, I think you make a compelling case in the book and, and, and that, um, uh, that there's a, a level of volunteerism, especially in membership. Mm -hmm. But if but if we're using this is where I the but but if we're using the Shodai, is this an insurance policy? Is it a kind of tax? Yes. Yeah. Or, or is it a, you know, I mean, because people will sort of give to the Red Cross, you know, the, the definition of volunteerism in English might be a little bit different. Can you elaborate what Cholai Kai mm -hmm. and, 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 
how is what's the feeling on the ground before? Yeah, it's a, actually the concept of volunteerism in the Western uh, language. I think it's very different. It's not charity. It's not volunteer because. It's like a tax, a due paying memberships and tax and insurance for the earthquakes. You pay the insurance for diseases and the earthquakes, right? And fire, fires. So this is kind of insurance and tax paying activities. So it's not volunteer, it's not charity spirit. It's just like a system. I mean, the mass system of volunteer in, in Japanese sense. So it's not like really the charity things. It's more like a pragmatic reason to join the Jerusalem, to prepare for massive disasters. So, so the focus there is, is at home, domestic. I mean, there's good reason there's an mm -hmm. nation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we tend to think of the international movement and war, for you know, but, but really, but what I understand is the Japanese Red Cross is really pioneering domestic disaster response. Yes, thoughts. yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's the Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. You you mentioned that the Japanese Red Cross was active in other parts of the world where there were substantial Japanese emigrant communities, mm -hmm. such as South America. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, for, for example, how the the Japanese Red Cross operated in Brazil, for example. Was it working with a local Brazilian yes. organization? How did the Brazilian government feel about a Japanese NGO operating in its territory? Yeah, they have a huge discussion between Japanese government and Brazilian government. And it was a kind of like a, uh, the, how to say, the initiative, um, foundation of the development aid in a contemporary sense. Um, in Brazil, São Paulo, Jesus and Hassist, it's the foundation of the Nippon Hospital. And they treated mainly Japanese immigrants, but also um, like a, uh, ep epidemic disease in jungles and to treat local um, Brazilians, uh, indigenous Brazilians. So it's like a kind of the development aid project in contemporary sense. But also they need uh, the Japanese uh, immigrants because in Brazil, Japanese immigrants are not really in, embedded into the society. They only speak Japanese. Like in Hawaii, Japanese are more communicated with Americans and Hawaiians and they're more mixed. But in Brazil, the Japanese uh, community are quite isolated. So they need the hospitals and have public health treatment. So that's why the GRS has established these um, four offices in Latin America to treat especially Japanese immigrants. Thank you. There's a question online here. I'll just read it out. Um, thank you so much for, you, for your very interesting talk. I must read your book as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, please. I wonder whether there is any difference between charity acts and the Japanese Red Cross. Could you please explain how you define charity mm. and humanitarian acts respectively? That sort of leads on from- Very good question. And charity, I think it's, I don't know, to give a fund from rich to poor, uh, but the Japanese um, is not charity, it's mutual aid, helping each other. So if you have some problems, you help your friends, but we also help friends give you back. So it's a mutual aid, but it's not one side aid from rich to poor like this, or big, uh, big companies to something who are suffering. But in Japan, People all suffering each other, especially during the aftermath of the tsunami and earthquake. Once the earthquake happened, everybody became victims. So victims are helping each other and they develop this kind of movement. I think, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting point because you said earlier, they, they move away from this Christian idea hmm. of charity, Caritas, hmm. which is yeah, it's not, it's a not. translation of love, actually. It's, it's, it's so very different. Charity is the disinfected form hmm. of love, so to speak. So this is a very interesting yeah. difference, I think. Yeah, Drew. Thank you. 
Can you say that this similar situation would still exist today? In Japan? Yes, of course, like a uh, insurance, a uh, health insurance system. This is also kind of the mutual aid nationwide. Yeah. And also once disaster occurred in Noto, uh, like uh, Kanazawa prefecture, many, many Japanese donated to this um, disaster in Kumamoto, whatever. Because people believe that when they had an earthquake, they would be uh, donated by other peoples. So it's kind of reverse. They expected the reverse from uh, in Japan and the other peoples. So an idea of reciprocity, um, essentially. Yeah, I think the national health insurance system is really like a mutual aid system in Japan. Thank you. If there are no more questions from the room, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask you, because the, the, when you introduced the book at the very beginning and you said, well, at the very end, mm. I'll return to the Hojoki, to Kamo no Chome. Uh. I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I was wondering whether you could elaborate um, a little bit on that, because you said well, it's, it's bearing witness that is the important yeah. thing. I just find that the Kamo no Chome's feeling about the aftermath of the disaster is just the same in, 12th century, Kyoto, Japan's capital, Kyoto, also suffered a great fire, earthquakes, tsunamis, and civil wars, and many people died, and they helping each other. I think it's just the same within the current movement in the Red Cross in Japan and worldwide. And also, he accepted the floating walls, like uh, the flow of the rivers never ceased, and people just born and die, and follow the next generation following the next uh, you know, the younger generation following and the new generation follows and just this is continuing endlessly. So I believe that this is like a human suffering is timeless and helping people is also like a timeless things. What a wonderful okay? point to <laughs> end on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please give a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>